Hello everybody, welcome back to another exciting edition of Ed Puzzle Lecture Notes on the Skeletal System. Today we're going to go over blood calcium regulation, how the levels of calcium in the blood is regulated. We're going to go over some different disorders and diseases with the skeletal system. But first we're going to look at the effects of stress and exercise on our skeletal system. Now the skeletal system is kind of like the muscular system in that the more you exercise and the more stress you put on those bones, the stronger they tend to get. So stre stress is going to increase the deposition of those mineral salts. And remember that is done by the osteoblasts. The osteoblasts are the ones that secrete those mineral salts which make the bone matrix, which makes your bone stronger. The stress will also increase the production of the collagen fibers. Maybe Remember, 25% of your skeleton is made up of collagen, and that's what gives it its elastic strength. So not so much hardness, but the ability to bend without snapping. Now, whenever you have a lack of mechanical stress, say you're bedridden, you're sick for a long time, or if you're an astronaut in weightless environments, that's having no stress on your bones, no stress on your skeletal system. With that lack of stress, then the resorption of the bone material is going to be greater than the deposition of those mineral salts. So that means it's those osteoclasts that are removing more bone material than the osteoblasts are putting in. Therefore, it's making your bones weaker. So the main thing you need to know that weight-bearing exercises... These are things that are very, very beneficial to your skeletal system and your bones because the more stress you can put on your bones, up to a point, you don't want to stress them too much, but the, if you stress your skeletal system, your bones, it actually makes them stronger. All right, now calcium homeostasis, the regulation of the amount of calcium that's in the blood. So obviously the skeleton is a reservoir. It's where calcium and phosphorus or phosphate is mainly stored in the body. It stores about 99% of the calcium in your body is within your skeleton. Now these calcium ions, I remember, remember from the, the nervous system, we saw that they played a very big role with neurons. The calcium channels would open, that which would stimulate the release of neurotransmitters into the synapse. Blood clotting or coagulation, basically if you get cut, it's what makes you stop bleeding. Enzymes, the proteins in your body which speed up chemical reactions, a lot of those rely on calcium as like a, a cofactor. And also your heart, for your heart to beat, calcium ions play a very important role for the contraction of the heart. And if calcium levels get too high or too low, I mean it's obviously bad, cardiac arrest if too high, respiratory arrest if too low. So we're going to go over how calcium levels are maintained relatively uh, even or balanced, how the homeostasis in, is maintained of calcium levels in the blood. And it's going to require a couple hormones and a couple of glands. One's called the parathyroid hormone, or PTH, secreted by the parathyroid gland. And also calcitonin, which is going to be secreted by the thyroid gland for when calcium levels get too high. All right, so let's see how this works. All right, so I'm not a real big fan of this slide. But feel free to write all that. So what you need to know is when blood calcium starts to go down, when it starts to dip down, that's when it's going to be the parathyroid gland is going to respond to this stimulus when blood calcium levels are low. CA plus. So that's going to be the parathyroid gland. It's going to secrete PTH or parathyroid hormone. Now this parathyroid hormone, PTH, signals the kidneys to both uptake more calcium from the blood and to secrete the hormone calcitriol. Calcitriol, where's that? Right here. Which is the active form of vitamin D, which signals your intestines to start taking in more calcium, to absorb more calcium. Now the PTH, or parathyroid hormone, also stimulates the osteo class to begin breaking down bone matrix to release that calcium from what's stored in the bone and releases it back into the blood which will bring all of those together will bring those calcium levels back up 
now when the opposite happens, when blood calcium levels start to rise, now it's going to be the thyroid gland, and it's going to secrete the hormone calcitonin. Now calcitonin is going to do the opposite of the PTH or parathyroid hormone. It is going to cause the kidneys to decrease their uptake or taking in of calcium from the blood. And it will also increase the activity of the osteoblast cells in the bone, which will take the calcium out of the, out of the blood and deposit it to form new bone matrix. So that taking calcium out of the blood by those osteoblasts will bring blood calcium levels back down. And now here's a really good image to show you how it's done. So here's when blood calcium, the ions of calcium ions becomes too high. This is where the thyroid gland becomes activated. It secretes the hormone calcitonin, which works on the kidneys. It reduces calcium ion uptake in the kidneys. And it also stimulates those osteoblasts to start taking that calcium and deposit it into the bones, which will bring the blood calcium levels back down into homeostasis. Now, when it gets when blood calcium levels are getting too low, that's where the parathyroid gland is going to kick in. And the parathyroid gland is going to secrete PTH or parathyroid hor hormone. That signals the kidneys to increase their uptake of calcium ions from the blood. And it's also going to stimulate the osteoclast to begin breaking down bone matrix to release the calcium minerals back into the blood. Now remember, the kidneys also secrete calcitriol, calcitriol, the active form of vitamin D, which increases the absorption of calcium by the intestines. And all these together will help to bring back the blood calcium levels in the blood. Aging and bone tissue. All right, so bone is being built through adolescence, and it holds its own in young adults. But as you get older, the bone gradually begins to become more and more brittle, and the bone material is being lost. Now, this is more common in women than in, than in men. So in women, it happens much earlier in your early 40s, and this is mainly due to estrogen levels falling after menopause. Estrogen has the effect of decreasing the activity of osteoclasts. So when there's estrogen present, both men and women have estrogen. Now, women have higher levels, but estrogens tend to inhibit osteoclasts, and those are the ones that break down bone tissue. So with less estrogen means there's more activity of the osteoclasts. That means they're going to be reabsorbing or taking away those minerals from the bone and putting it into the blood. And in males, it happens much later in life, after age 60, and in males, usually it's due to dropping in testosterone. Testosterone is important for protein synthesis, both for building muscle and for bone. And also testosterone is converted into estrogen in males, and that estrogen helps to inhibit the activity of osteoclasts. And remember, it's those osteoclasts that reabsorb or break down the bone matrix and return it to the blood. And now a condition of the condition of osteoporosis, which is a decreased bone mass, which causes porous and brittle bones. So this means the bone resorption from the osteoclasts is faster than the deposition by the osteoblasts. Now those are risk at risk for basically everybody. Now about 80% of people with osteoporosis in the United States are, are females, so only 20% are male. But it usually has to do with, if you're allergic to milk, it's usually your diet. So if you're not getting enough calcium, you're not getting enough vitamin D or phosphorus, those are the people that are going to be most prone to get osteoporosis, the weakening of their, of their bones. Now a way to prevent or decrease the severity of osteoporosis, definitely an adequate diet, weight-bearing exercises again, so even things like jogging, or uh, walking are good for your, your bones, and estrogen replacement or hormone therapy for women. For men, it could be hormone therapy, but it would be giving them testosterone, not estrogen. 
and now a couple, a couple other dis- disorders of bone ossification or skeletal system disorders. The first one's called rickets. Rickets is a condition where the bones are soft and rubbery, so they're not very rigid. And this is almost always because of poor diet as an infant. And mainly you're not getting enough calcium or enough vitamin D. Now, rickets is pretty rare in the United States since like the Great Depression, back when nutrition was pretty poor back in the 1930s. Rickets was kind of an issue, but not so much anymore. Pretty rare. Now, the next one, shin splints. Very, very common. I used to get it pretty much every year in spring training just by being on my feet all day from like 8 in the morning till about 5 in the afternoon. And shin splints can be very painful. It's pain along the tibia, remember that's your shin bone, and it's inflammation of that outer membrane around your bone called the periosteum. Now this is something that's usually not very serious, it usually just goes away on its own with a little ice and rest, but extreme cases can involve some micro tears and cracks of the tibia itself, but that's pretty rare. Uh, The next one's a herniated disc, so if you remember... In between the vertebra, if you remember in our lab, there was that little thing that looked like rubber, and no one really knew what that was, that soft thing. That was the intervertebral disc. It's fibrocartilage that's in in between each one of your discs, and sometimes it can rupture or herniate, which means it bulges out. And then when it bulges out, especially in in the lumbar region, it can oftentimes pinch on what's called your sciatic nerve and create what's called sciatica. And that's where it'll be a a numbness or a tingling sensation that'll travel down one of your legs and that's called caused by a herniated disc in your vertebral column. And two more, another one's not a real big deal but a bunion. That's the deformity of the big toe which is caused by wearing tightly fitting shoe fitted shoes. So it's kind of like a bump on your big toe which is caused by calluses and inflammation. And the last one's going to be called scoliosis, and that's the sideways bending of the vertebral column in the thoracic region. And it seems to be genetic in origin. And there'll be a couple pictures on this next slide to show you what this looks like. And here's a couple pictures. First, the bunion. That is a really, really bad one. So that's the bump right there at the, the first joint of the big toe. And it causes that the big toe to curve inward like that. Now this can, bunions can be removed, bunionectomy, and that'll cause, that'll create your, your toes to line up normally again. Now here's scoliosis, which is a curvature of the spinal column like that. You can see that. Now in this severe case, sometimes they can use a back brace that you'll have to wear pretty much all the time to straighten up. Straighten out that um, the spinal cord, or sometimes you can do a, a surgery, a spinal fusion, which basically joins together your vertebra, so there's no more movement allowed, so it keeps them more in line. So those are your two of your aging bone aging diseases. All right, there you, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll talk to you next time.